Paris, 1979. A young woman named Sophie of about 26 years old returns to her hometown after several years of traveling. Not knowing many people and feeling a stranger in Paris, she begins to follow people in the street, letting strangers reintroduce her to the city. At a party one night, she sees a man she had followed earlier that day. Upon learning that the man is planning a trip to Venice, she decides to tail him there, behind the guise of large sunglasses and a blonde wig, documenting the journey through sly photographs and journaling. Proving to be a fruitful experience, our heroine continues with several other games, some of which include the following. Inviting strangers and friends to sleep in her room in eight-hour shifts while photographing them and documenting their conversations. Working temporarily as a hotel maid, piecing together the lives of the guests through the clues left by their personal effects and the state of their rooms. And the year she spent interviewing the blind on their idea of beauty, again documented through photographs and text as we can see in this piece entitled Blind Number 19. It's 1992 in New York City, and the writer Paul Auster, in his book Leviathan, invents a character based on the life of our heroine Sophie, whom he describes as an artist, but the work she ha did had nothing to do with creating objects commonly defined as art. Some people called her a photographer, others referred to her as a conceptualist, still others considered her a writer, but none of these descriptions was accurate, and in the end, I don't think she can be pigeonholed in any way. Her work was too nutty for that, too idiosyncratic, too personal to be thought of as belonging to any particular medium or discipline. Ideas would take hold of her, she would work on projects, there would be concrete results that could be shown in galleries, but this activity didn't stem from a desire to make art so much as from a need to indulge her obsessions, to live her life precisely as she wanted to live it. This is Sophie Cal, writer, photographer, detective, voyeur, filmmaker, conceptual artist, a fictional character in novels, and a real-life enigma a woman who wears many hats, oscillating between fiction and real life. Sophie Cal is a prolific artist who we will get to know through, through her piece Blind Number 19 from 1986 in this edition of Slow Art brought to you by the Modern Art Museum of Fort Worth. Of the Blind series, Cal said, I spent one year with blind people who were born, born blind, who had never seen, and I asked them what their image of beauty was. Each work is composed of a portrait of the blind man or woman and a color photography trying to represent what beauty is to their eyes. All of the pieces in this series are composed in the same fashion as blind number 19. A black and white portrait photo is taken of the subject or narrator, accompanied by text explaining beauty according to the subject, and then a color photograph aiming to depict what is described in the text. In the case of blind number 19, the text reads, the man I live with is the most beautiful thing I know, even though he could be a little taller. I've never come across absolute perfection. I prefer well-built men. It's a question of size and shape. Facial features don't mean much to me. What pleases me aesthetically is a man's body, slim and muscular. All of the speakers in this series remain anonymous. The text is presented simply as if it were pulled from a book or journal. The two photographs, portrait and the interpretation, are hinged on the text, without which the images make little sense. Let's pause a moment on the portrait of the speaker, whom I will call Miss 19 for simplicity. The portrait photos are taken at a close distance in black and white. It is an uncomfortable image, provoking a feeling of voyeurism, knowing that we are looking at someone who cannot return the gaze. The sunglasses she wears keeps us at a distance. The photograph is simultaneously direct and elusive. While close up, we remain far from the subject. The anonymity of the subject contrasts with the intimacy of the scene she describes. The text in quotes is in a delicate italic font, floating in the middle of the frame, taking up barely half of it. The text conveys authority, particularly in the decisive phrase, I've never come across absolute perfection. The aesthetic qualities of beauty for Miss 19 are found in the proportions of the body, in the mass of a body, but also with the person she has a relationship with. While this may seem logical for someone who cannot see, it isn't the case as is shown in another piece from the series. 
In blind green, for example, we see a young woman identifying green as the aesthetic criteria of beauty. Green is beautiful because every time I like something, I'm told it's green. Grasses, green, trees, leaves, nature too. I like to dress in green. Not only does this interpretation highlight the visual quality of beauty passed to the speaker by others, but it also shows the interplay of meaning between the world of those with and without sight. By contrast, Miss 19's definition is not determined by the information passed on by others, but upon her own parameters. She says, what pleases me, seemingly impervious and indifferent to what others are pleased by. Similarly, in blind hair, my room, we see a portrait of the speaker, the accompanying text which says, hair is magnificent, especially African hair. I curl up in women's long hair. I pretend I'm a cat and meow. My room is oblong. There's nothing in, in it. It's clean, just a fridge and grass outside the window. It's beautiful, at least I think so, and I believe what I want to believe. Similar to Miss 19, this speaker also takes an authorita authoritative and personalized stance. He also assigns beauty to things that can be felt rather than seen. The second photograph aims to translate the text of the speaker into an image as we see through the reclining figure of a man, the camera's focus trained on the musculature of the man's shoulders while his face is cloaked in shadows. The state of disarray in the bed and the limited clothing of the man depicts a scene undoubtedly of lovers and reflects the woman's definition of beauty lying in romantic intimacy. The photograph is sliced diagonally in half in segments of dark and light. The crumpled sheets mirror the creases in the man's shoulders and the soft light enters the scene horizontally. Let us now turn our focus to the central ideas which concern Sophie Kell's artistic practice, the blind series, and blind number 19 in particular. A common theme in Kell's work is how meaning is created through the actions of people, in this case, beauty. All words have an element of ambiguity, though beauty is particularly difficult to pin down. What makes one face beautiful does not necessarily work for another, and the qualities of beauty are not limited solely to visual and aesthetic criteria, but also express emotions towards something. Though we may easily discern with broad consensus what is red from what is blue, circles from squares, apples from oranges, the descriptor of beautiful is assigned to multiple things that may have little in common or that in different situations may not work out. Determining whether something is beautiful then is based on an assemblage of collective, relational, and individual aesthetic values. Beyond the curiosity of how individuals define beauty, examining how beauty or any other descriptive term is bestowed and negotiated, and the capability of language to pin down complex ideas is adeptly showcased in this work. Where did Cal come up with this? How did she think it up, and why is it art? Let's take a brief journey through Cal's early life and some of her intellectual influences in order to find where these ideas come from. Sophie Cal was born in October of 1953 and grew up in an unconventional and artistically rich environment. Her father, Bob Cal, was an oncologist, but more importantly for young Sophie, he was also an art collector and directed the Contemporary Art Museum in Nimes. Though not educated in art, he had a good eye, spotting the value of artists before they gained recognition and soaring prices. And the walls of his house were filled with the likes of Roy Lichtenstein, Lawrence Weiner, and Cy Twombly, to name a few. Cal's mother, on the other hand, Monique Sindler, was a book critic and journalist, the type of person who read and reread Proust, as Cal would say. Her mother was wild and funny and loved to be the center of attention. The combination of literature from the side of her mother and visual arts from the side of her father is harmoniously balanced in their daughter. Cal's father, the more serious of the two parents, insisted that Cal attend college. Despite Cal's intellectually rich environment at home, the academic life did not appeal to her. Her father was persistent and eventually Cal enrolled in the University of Nanterre to study sociology in exchange for an allowance. Among her first instructors was the renowned sociologist Jean Baudrillard, who 
in very simplistic terms, specialized in, in examining how the media, fashion, advertising, sports, and other cultural products use symbols to structure the narratives which inform our everyday lives. As a mentor and collaborator, Baudrillard would instill in Cal an interest in how meaning is negotiated. Luckily for Cal, Baudrillard didn't think that university would offer her as much as living in the world would, and so he helped her to complete her degree by forging her way through. This enabled Cal to keep her stipend from her father flowing while she traveled around the world for the next seven years. In the small seaside town of Bolinas, an hour north of San Francisco, Cal rented the house of a photographer. She began to take pictures using the equipment and this sparked an interest in photography. Cal's path to becoming an artist was still a way off and at this point photography was more of a hobby. Returning to Paris in 1979, we find ourselves at the beginning of our story when our heroine begins her engagement in espionage. The games Cal were playing were more about staving off boredom than creating works of art. It wasn't until the Sleepers Project, where she had invited people to sleep in her bed in eight-hour shifts, that Cal fell into art. One of the so-called Sleepers was the wife of an art critic, who upon completing her shift in Cal's bed, told her husband of what she had experienced. And voila, Cal was invited to exhibit her work, and then invited again, and again, and again, until the present. It would seem that art found Sophie Cal and not the other way around, but whichever way the egg or chicken was ordered, it stuck for good. Though Cal would say that she never went into a museum until her work was exhibited in one, it is clear that Cal's early years had an abundance of artistic influences, both in the visual arts and literature. She certainly would have been aware of the experimental games of the Surrealists, as well as the Ulipo literary group of the 1960s. The latter was a group of writers who experimented with the creative process by setting up arbitrary rules which constrained and structured their writing. Through the constraints, they found new means of creativity. Through the restriction, new avenues of invention. Cal is often associated with this group as she employs similar arbitrary rules in her work. Her ideas are often prompted by a spark, overhearing a conversation in the street, latching onto a comment of a friend, and this idea is then explored through a structured game which she adheres to until its natural conclusion. The rules of the game determine the way the ideas will be explored, while the text and photographs that accompany Cal's work serve to document this game. By the time Cal began her first creative endeavors in the late 80s, conceptual art was already in full swing. For conceptualists, the art object filling up gallery space was a consequence of the ideas behind them and not the focal point. As Solowit would say in his Sentences on Conceptual Art, published in 1967, ideas can be works of art. They are a chain of development that may eventually find some form. All ideas need not be made physical. The less visually intricate the piece of art, the greater the focus on the ideas. For many artists, the use of text replaced traditional art forms like painting and sculpture, which could distract the viewer from the ideas behind them. Text enabled a more direct communication of the concepts to the viewer, as exemplified by Hamish Fulton's Rock Fall Echo Dust on the right and Jenny Holzer's Kind of Blue, both of which are part of the permanent collection at the Modern. Through her father, Cal would have certainly been exposed to the work of conceptual artists such as Saul LeWitt, Joseph Kosuth, and Lawrence Weiner, who are all working with text. The simplicity of Cal's work presented on the wall similarly adheres to the priority of ideas in art making. Cal's goal with photography was never to make attractive images and serve to document, to communicate how the ideas played out. While Cal didn't aim to diminish the presence and importance of what hung on the wall, she did prioritize ideas over form, particularly in her early projects. While not unpleasing, the photographs we see in blind number 19 are not intriguing without the text and the project to support them. While in the world of visual arts of the 60s, ideas were taking center stage, in the world of literature, the idea of authorship was being challenged. In 1967, Roland Barthes, the renowned French literary theorist and semiotician, pub published his seminal work, The Death of the Author. 
In this work, he suggests that a piece of literature, rather than being the product of a single individual, is a multidimensional space in which a variety of writings, none of them original, blend and clash. The author is then a sort of mediator for all of the collective writings, meanings, and narratives of the, of the culture they belong to. What becomes important for Barth is not the author, but the reader. This theory recognizes the cumulative effort inherent in the production of culture and meaning and the shift in the importance of interpretation, both in literary and visual arts. It is no longer important for the individual artist to be the sole creator and craftsman, and the interpretation of a text gains increasing importance. Art had for some time been relinquishing its individualistic grasp on the act of creation, whether that be through the appropriation rampant in pop art, the involvement of audiences in performance art, and the manufacturing practices which outsourced object making common in minimalism and conceptual art. With blind number 19, Cal has also outsourced a part of the authorial act to Miss 19. The words, funneled through Cal, belong to Miss 19. There is no reason to doubt that the words quoted are not verbatim. However, this was most certainly not the only thing Miss 19 said. Therefore, the task of curating what to include and leave out is at Cal's discretion. Again, this makes Cal co-owner and mediator through which ideas are filtered, shaped, and then placed on a wall for the audience to read. Even the picture of the reclining man created by Cal is a mixture of Miss 19's words, Cal's interpretation, and the symbols we use to create collective meaning. While in many ways it faithfully reflects what Miss 19 has narrated, there are several elements that originate with Cal. For example, Miss 19 never referred to crumpled sheets, nor to the colors and shapes of textiles, nor to the angle of light in the room, just to mention a few things. These are symbols that are employed by Cal to communicate a romantic scene or narrative. Both image and text reflect the interplay between author and reader, truth and fabrication. While we have focused only on the blind series and specifically blind number 19, Cal's work merits our time for its breadth, ingenuity and play, overlapping into film and sculpture and performance art with each project Sophie Cal undertakes. She plays between the borders of fact and fiction, narrator and reader, private and public. Through blind number 19, Cal has excavated how concepts accumulate, gain meaning, and are then dispersed. As we take a long look at blind number 19, we might ask ourselves how we see and what our sight is composed of.